We're in 1 Peter. This is teaching number 11. In our previous teachings, we've learned that it is expected that those who are keeping in step with the Holy Spirit will see it as their task to be a blessing to others, to bless others. That's your job, bless others. The psalmist advises us the same thing, Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. Whoever wants to embrace life and see a day fill up with good, Here's what you do. Say nothing evil or hurtful. Snub evil and cultivate good. Run for peace for all your worth. God looks on with approval, listening and responding well to what he's asked. But he turns his back on those who do evil things. So your job is to bless. Now before we delve into the word today, we have to make some distinctions. We have to make some distinctions concerning suffering. Now Peter's letter addresses what to do when you're suffering because of your faith in Christ. Okay, that's really important to know. You've taken a stand and that stand is not culturally acceptable. Because others know that you're a Christian, you are being persecuted. So Peter also addressed what he called unjust suffering, what, what to do if you're being treated poorly or even abusively by someone else. And this was specifically addressed to slaves. You can see that these two types of sufferings, they, they kind of overlap. They, they really do. Now, there's a third type of suffering that happens because we live in a world with people who are not as God intended it for them to be. And then there's also natural disaster, disease, birth defects, and evil can create suffering in our lives. You're not suffering because of your faith. For instance, there might be an abusive relationship within the home. You don't... In Endure by convincing yourself, oh, this must be God's will. Instead, what you do is you take action, you get out of harm's way, and then you use your suffering, you use it, you redeem it to make a difference in the world. Let me give you a couple examples. First of all, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, that organization was the result of suffering, and they used it to make a difference. Megan's Law is another. The Child Abuse and Prevention uh, Treatment Act is yet another. The Christopher and Dana Rees Foundation is another difference maker that was born out of suffering. Joni Erickson Tata comes to mind turning her quadriplegia into a platform for ministering to millions. We might kind of call this type of suffering natural suffering. Now the type of suffering that Peter is advising us about is the sufferings of Christ. Disciples take a stand in the sufferings of Christ. They take up part in the sufferings of Christ. Persecuted for telling the truth and persecuted for doing good. In our lesson today, Peter focuses our attention on being persecuted for doing good and what believers' response should be when they face opposition to the faith. Further, Peter will tell us to be ready to have an intelligent testimony concerning why we believe what we believe. This teaching of Peter, it rests on the requirement of living an exemplary life, living a life of holiness, being a follower of Jesus. And if that is the intent of your heart, let's get in the Word, shall we? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And here the Word of God reads, If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, Keep your heart at attention, in adoration before Christ your Master. Be ready to speak and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need the bath. It's better to suffer doing good if that's what God wants than to be punished for doing evil. And that's the word. Peter asked us a very rhetorical question, and the simple answer is no. No one's going to stop you if you're set on doing good. Yet there are many stories of men and women living exemplary lives, holy lives, persisting in doing good, and then getting killed. I mean, Jesus is an example, right? Now, not as drastic as those stories, we hear the government stopping people from distributing food to the poor without a license has happened in Long Beach. So, to truthfully answer that question, no, you must look in hope to the faithfulness of God. Now, doing something with heart and soul means that you're dedicated and passionate about doing the good that you're doing. If you are stopped in your endeavors, 
then you must trust God that God will use those efforts to bring about some good, even if you're stopped. Romans 8.28 That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Wow. Even if they kill you because of your good deeds, they, whoever they are, can't stop the influence of your actions that will go on and continue in the world. Amen. The film, The End of the Spear, is the story of Jim Elliott and his companions who were murdered by tribesmen in the jungle of Ecuador. And how that stopping good eventually became a blessing to many. The End of the Spear, check it out. You can, maybe you can stream it now, I don't, I'm not sure. God can do amazing things with our disasters. Are you ready for that? God can do amazing things with our disasters. Yeah. He can. For the most part, Peter is telling us that if we have set ourselves to do good, people generally appreciate it. They recognize the selflessness. But if they don't, and you end up suffering because of your loving service to others, Peter says, you know what? You're still in good shape. Again, we have to take a larger view, looking in hope to the faithfulness of God. Jesus told us this. He said, you're blessed. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. That persecution drives you deeper into the kingdom. When you suffer for the faith, you depend upon God that much more. You spend more time in prayer. And you become more steadfast in your obedience. You practice those seven habits of a disciple stringently, diligently. And you know you do that because such practices invites encounters with God. And then living with a sense of God's approval, my friends, that is a huge blessing. Plus, many times... You see your efforts making a difference in the lives of others. And that's a blessing. Jesus tells us why you can be glad in this type of suffering. Why you can be glad. He says this. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you're in good company. My prophets and my witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. When you suffer for righteousness' sake, you take your place with the highly commended of God. You do. Your spiritual position is with the prophets, the witnesses, the saints, and the martyrs. Your spiritual position is with Jesus, who suffered for righteousness' sake. And I believe that such a realization, if you grab hold of it, is a blessing. It's a consolation for you know that you are being persecuted for God's kingdom. And this empowers you to keep on keeping on as you trust God for the outcome of your labor of love. Okay? Selflessness only comes when there is a great love in your heart. Now, gentlemen, instead of love, you may prefer to think of a great duty and a great honor. Sometimes they're indistinguishable. Selflessness means that, that sometimes suffering for good is exactly what Jesus wanted you to do because that's exactly what He did. Don't let the fear of others, the fear of persecution for standing up for what's right, stop you from doing good. Be a good citizen. Yeah, follow the rule of law. Certainly, live an exemplary life. Yes, live life to the full, of course. And don't allow the ungodly to threaten you into disobeying God. Instead, give your full allegiance to Jesus. Now, when the scripture refers to Jesus as Lord, that's exactly what it means. Now, Lord is a, a title given to the one who has authority and, and power and, and who's in charge. When believers call Jesus Lord, it is a declaration of their devotion and of their respect. That bent knee, that bent knee is a demonstration of your loyalty and allegiance. It's a sign of your submission, of your subservience to His will done His way. 
It means you're all in with Jesus, regardless of the circumstances. You're all in. To call Jesus your Lord is to affirm His supremacy in your life. Now, don't delude yourself thinking that the proclamation is all that's necessary. For the proclamation, Jesus is Lord demands obedience. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says, Many who say, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, excuse me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You called me Lord, but really didn't do what I wanted you to do. You didn't love. Remember, God is both Father and Judge. Jesus is both Friend and Lord. One day, every believer, <laughs> one day even the non-believers, will give an account for how they live their earthly lives. Everyone will. Believers back up their profession of faith with deeds of righteousness. The unbeliever, of course, can't. Well, they may have done good things, but it's not salvation by works or the good that you do. Ask the thief on the cross who ended up in paradise. Make sure your heart is always in the right place and that in that heart of yours, you place Jesus in the center. People will see you doing good in the name of Jesus, okay? And if they don't try to stop you, they may ask why you're doing what you're doing. Peter writes, be ready to speak up to, uh, and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you're living and do so with the utmost courtesy, okay? <laughs> why aren't you laughing with the sinners instead of crying with the saints, Christians are not required to know the answer to every theological question that someone might ask regarding the Christian faith. But they should be able to provide an intelligent account of what they believe and what they have experienced. Your intelligent answer, that intelligent answer is your testimony. It's your testimony. This is your story of how you came to believe and why now you're doing the things that you're doing. It's the story of the hope that you have in this life and the next. If you're not ready to tell someone about your experience with Jesus, then get busy. Prepare. It might help for you to write down your thoughts. Just imagine this. Someone asks you, well, why are you, why are you a Christian? And then practice your answer. Maybe do it for a mirror. Peter advises that our answer must be given with the utmost respect for the one listening. You see, there's no argument to win. You're just telling someone why you have the hope in Christ that you do. It's kind of like this. This was my life before I became a believer. This is my life after I became a believer. And I do what I do out of gratitude. Amen. They might laugh at you. They might call you ignorant or superstitious or give you a thousand reasons as to what you believe is just simply a fairy tale. You know what you do? You just thank them for their concern and tell them regardless that you're going to continue to love others with the love that God has lavished upon you. Do you know, it just might be that your intelligent and gentle answer wins them to the Lord. <coughs> Also, Peter talks about that living an exemplary life, you need to keep a clear conscience. A clear conscience. A clear conscience means hey, you practice what you preach. Okay, You try to live what you believe. A clear conscience means that you've handled the situation properly. You did what God wanted to be done. And a clear conscience also means <laughs> you've done your best to clean up your mess. Okay? Because we make messes all the time. If you didn't live up to the high standards of holiness in your interactions with others, you ask the one you offended to forgive you. You, you may have to compensate them according to how, whatever you did, for what was done. 
And after you've got right with your brother or sister, <laughs> then you ask God to forgive you. Don't bother asking God first. <laughs> Go make it right with somebody else first. And then ask God to forgive you. And that's how you clear your conscience. Now, if you're having problems with nagging guilt, on January 29th of this year, Dr. Mike Pratt's presentation, Freedom from Guilt Will Help You. Okay, Mike laid out some great, great insight. You'll find this teaching online on our website, www.hbcc.life, and also on our YouTube channel, HBCC Life. Okay, look that up if you're interested and want to dig a little deeper. The bottom line here is a clear conscience convinces you that you have done no wrong or what you did wrong, you made right. And the reason for keeping a clear conscience is so that when you're accused of wrongdoing, your reputation is like Teflon. And the accusations, they just don't stick. What's more, God may use their slander to wake them up to the condition of their souls. Now, I have never found myself in a suffering situation when I thought, oh, this is good. God must be doing something extraordinary. <laughs> no, never. Never has happened. Peter tells us it's better to suffer for doing good than doing evil, doing what's contrary to the will of. See, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I'd rather suffer because I'm doing God's will than to suffer because I made some kind of mess, right? But still, I'm not happy about the situation if I'm suffering. And the key to handling righteous suffering is having the faith that God is accomplishing something good from your pain. That's right. You know what? It is impossible to see in the moment. You don't see that in the moment, but you get through. You endure because you trust God to use you to make a difference in the world. We'll explore that in some greater detail next time in Lesson 12. But here's what you can take home from this teaching today, okay? There are different types of suffering. There's persecution suffering, and there's natural suffering, and there's suffering from disobedience. Peter has addressed how to handle persecution that comes from your living an exemplary life. Never surrender your loyalty. Keep your fidelity to the Lord. Make Jesus preeminent in your life first. Prepare yourselves, he says, to tell others the reason you've chosen to live a devout and holy life. A life of service. Be able to be to, to articulate why you are a Christ follower. And then keep your conscience clear by intending to do good. Doing the good you intend. And to make things between you and others good. You do those three things, my friends, and you are doing well. You do those three things and you are living a devout and holy life. If you do those three things, you are like Jesus in this world. You know what? You do those three things and you're living the yes. Yes, Lord.